Welcome to the Intriguing Beings podcast with me, Rue Chater. Episode 19 with Lewis Craven. Hi everyone, hope you had a good week last week and you got some fun lined up for this week. We're in Cape Town still and the King of the Air waiting period has just begun. It's looking like there might be a bit of wind for Thursday's action. Um, so check out IK Surf Mag if you want to watch the event. We'll put the links up and let you know how you can watch it. Done the first of my South African podcast chronicles, I guess, today, which was a really enjoyable one. So you're going to enjoy listening to this one with Lewis. And it's quite interesting, actually. I've been here for a week working on deadline, and I figured I'd have loads of these racked up by now. But I've actually been really busy. So today was a bit of a panic one, recorded uh, literally on Sunday and published on Monday. Lewis is an interesting chap and I've been wanting to speak to him for a while and I figured we'd probably do a few whilst we're here in Cape Town because it's easy to get hold of him. He's normally travelling around quite a bit. You'll know him as the man that touched the sky and jumped over Brighton Pier. So if you remember that amazing footage of the kiteboarder that jumped over the pier, Lewis is the man that did that. He's also the guy that nearly died at the Red Bull King of the Air two years ago and it was a horrifying crash that left him about as close to dead as you can be without being dead, basically. And he made a full recovery from it and actually rode at the King of the Air last year. He's one of the only riders alongside Sam Light to ride the King of the Air event every year that it's happened since the the new format has been released here in Cape Town. And he's really looking forward to competing again this year. I know he's gunning for a podium. Ideally, he wants to take the win and he's got the skills and talent to do it. Anyway, in this episode, we chat about all sorts. I wanted to tee up Lewis first off with a bit of an intro so you get to know him a little bit better. So we talk about his old days in the sport, how he got into it, the early days competing and winning the British Championships and where he went from there. Of course, we talk about that incredible jump over Brighton Pier and it's interesting to hear that he's still not bored of talking about it nearly 10 years on and actually still relishes in that huge achievement that he um Put together that year in 2009 I think it was. Then we move on to his terrible crash and I feel a bit cliche chatting to Lewis about the two things that have kind of defined his kiteboarding career but you can't have an interview with him without discussing those and in future episodes of the podcast we'll talk about some of his more modern exploits and other things that he does within his career because he's not just a pro rider he does a lot of other different stuff as well which I find really interesting but we thought we'd save those for another episode. Anyway, we sat down outside Lewis's modest pad, which is basically a glorified shed in Cape Town. One of the things I like about Lewis, he's quite grounded. Um, He actually doesn't own a smartphone, which makes hooking up with him quite difficult. He's still rocking a Nokia 3310, I think he's got at the moment. Um, And he used to have an answer machine message on his phone back in the day where you phoned up and he would just say, hey, you've got hold of Lewis. I haven't got any money. I'm not going to call you back. Try and call me again at another time. And it always used to make me chuckle. And seeing where Lewis is staying in Cape Town, he's very grounded. And, you know, he's not living an extravagant lifestyle or anything like that. He's happy with what he's got. And it's nice to see someone who came from a very modest background and didn't have perhaps the support of parents that some kids on the tour have got. And he's made it. You know, he's a fully legit international pro rider who's competing with the best of the best at the world's premier stage in South Africa at the King of the Air event. And for Lewis, that's quite a huge achievement, I think, and something I respect a lot. Anyway, let's get into it. I'm not going to bore you any more with my waffle. So without any further chat from me, here's this week's episode. I hope you enjoy it. So I'm sat here in Cape Town with a gentleman called Lewis Craven, who I've known for some time now, probably since very early on in my kite surfing days. I think we started around the sort of same sort of time. I think I was maybe a couple of years ahead of Lou. And I first met him on a beach in Whitstable and he was that keen on kiteboarding that he would drive around and just body drag about the place because he couldn't afford a board at the time. Now he's on the Duotone international team. Uh, He's someone who I hold up as probably one of the most professional kiteboarders in the sport. He sends out newsletters, he works with schools and kids and getting people into the sport and he's kind of not just your... I'm a pro rider, I'm going to do my tricks, that's all I care about. He's kind of the full package with coaching, looking after the young of the sport, making sure people are encouraged, and I thought he'd be a good person to have on this podcast. We're going to try and do a few, because he's got lots of stories and lots of things to talk about, but this episode we're going to chat a little bit about where Lewis has come from, and where he's got to, and where he's going in the future. So Lewis, 
how did you get into kiting? Because you were a rollerblader or something at the beginning, weren't you? I don't want to embarrass you by saying I was, that. I but... was all sorts of stuff. First, <laughs> thanks for having me on your podcast. <laughs> As you quite know, I like to talk about a lot of stuff. I'm quite opinionated. And those listening might want to hear how opinionated I am. I'm often messaging Rue with my thoughts, negative <laughs> and positive, about pretty much everything. That's very so true. I'm glad I haven't upset him too much to still speak to me. But I started <laughs> off as a basically a sportsman. I think my younger years can be really um, looked at as just a sportsman. I've got two brothers. One's two years older, one's two years younger. My dad's very into sports, was a very good football player, so was I. Um, and I was into racket sports, then I got into inline skating, and then I was really into uh, springboards. From about 10 to 15, I got really into springboards with a group of guys and really pushed it as far as where I could be upside down and learnt all my aerial awareness. And then got into windsurfing when I was about 16. I got something okay. free out of the paper and the Friday ad, they're all free. Still to this day, anything windsurfing related which is 20 years ago or something it's all free in the paper so i just look it up and get yeah, it. i persuaded my dad to put that on the roof of the car and because i live on the seafront in worthing thought well i could maybe do something out on the water i was always fascinated by the big storms that come in and would try and get out there in the big storms either on a stupid little bodyboard or something and got battered a few times but <laughs> I, I think i always uh was fascinated by the the, the uniqueness of, of the once-off occasions that would come like that and it led to I suppose a wind sport in windsurfing and then kiting when I saw that take off at Lansing when I was about 17 j- just yeah 17 coming on 18 which really these days is quite an old age to get in but that is, back, but then, back it then it was, was still it was quite young, young wasn't it and so yeah. you were still at school at that point I was still at school when I windsurfed at high school and then actually um, I loved windsurfing so much and just started to see kiting that I went to college for the sole purpose of, of maximising my time on the water. There was no plan behind that except for I wasn't ready to go to full-time work, which my elder brother had and people around me were, so I just thought, how can I avoid that? So I went to college and <laughs> that, that was my plan. <laughs> but no real plans to do anything with what you were doing at college? No, to try I, and... I guess in a way I chose things I was passionate about. Um, the internet had come out when I was 16. That was a major influence on my life and the way I think about life as far as still remembering half my life without internet and devices and all the social media I'm sure we'll get to chat about that at some (laughs) point but I very much remember that half of my life and and how exciting it was so I did web design because I was into web design and graphics and I also did photography which are things I loved and and what I think is really nice about that is that they came back to be very useful tools for me now that I'm a professional kiteboarder and I didn't realize that at the time but it also gave me a lot of time to kite surf, which was great. Yeah, so you're getting time on the water. Yeah. And who was it that first kind of got you into kiteboarding? How You said you saw it down at Lansing, but were there any sort of characters around at that time? Definitely, yeah. There was. I'd, I'd probably have to credit um, a guy called Roger Chapman, who was a paraglider. Keen, do you remember that guy? I'm not yeah. sure. He was part of the BKSA days. Um, paraglider, very... very um, uh, intellectual guy about wings and flying and taught me a lot of those days um kev mcguire is another yeah. guy that he's really, still around isn't really he? influenced me back then like he, these are the sorts of guys which weren't my age range you know yeah. and i think as a youngster you often mix with people your own age especially when you're 15 16 17 and suddenly i found this world of adults men and women in their 30s 40s all almost like mentoring me in a way and teaching me a new way of life so those two were great. Um, Jez Hangtime Jones would, was the guy at Goring that I saw with the orange, black and white. I think it was a Nash V2. Was it, was it V2? I can't even remember the name. X, X2. X2, X2, maybe. X2 something like that. Yeah. It looked like a tiger. <laughs> I was fascinated by it. The best looking kite. And, and people came to me and offered advice uh, and they weren't negative about you know i was doing stupid stuff i was putting the outside lines on the inside i was doing <laughs> you know back then i didn't really know what to do very much wanted to be self-taught there was jake's grace as well that had been around the scene for a while well, there weren't really um, kite schools back then were there it was no, kind of really well, early in a way there was there was more access to a shop than there is now in a way in my town so there was dirt and surf a shop in worthing where i think jake worked at there was also neil hilder who was actually a big inspiration because he was the young kid that was on an international team with air rush was competing traveling the world and he was from my town so that was something i looked at and thought wow this this someone is actually really doing it here obviously there's um i'd have to mention nick baker as well and both yeah. the baker brothers to that 
respect they were big names in windsurfing still are and they came from my area so there was a number of different influences and people around and I I guess I was really inspired by that I never thought I want to do what they're doing but I, I kept my mind open about the way their their paths had gone I suppose and, and more so that they'd come from my town that was important to me yeah so you could see that someone from your area could actually carve a career out of water sports Definitely, and end was up possible. on the international stage I recognized that I must be in a good spot for this sport if these people live there you know it was that simple I was like this must be great so that further drew me into it and it is like where you live you get sea breezes in the summer right and it is one of the windier spots in the UK I guess like Windy Worthing Windy no, Worthing yeah, there you go I'm a massive fan of Windy Worthing I believe it's the kite surfing capital of the country we do not have a season there's no on off there's great summers great autumns great winters I mean I really do engineer my time in the year to spend as much time there than, than most people in the UK I think compared to some of the other pro riders I just love it there I'll stay all the way up to New Year's Day or even 6th of January because I love the winter conditions that's my passion and in a way that's what's brought me out here to to do these king of the air events and that that's that's where my roots were and I like to get as much time as I can. It, it absolutely devastates me if a storm blows up at home and I can't be there. I, I would try and shape it that I can get back for it or something. I hate that thing of all the locals talking about how good it is, you know, like I'm still sensitive to that. Watching the woo scores go up. Yeah, and missing I, out. Oh, it's devastating. That's interesting because yeah. a lot of people, they grow up at home and then they just want to get away. And that's like, they've got sort of a negative outlook on being at home, whereas you've got quite a different flip side. And especially coming from a the career that you're in where you're traveling to these amazing spots around the world like I know you went to New Zealand recently and you know you've been to some fantastic beaches but for you home is still number where one. it's at it's always going to be number one because of the I think the deeper underlying meaning and feelings I have towards it I, I recognize that some people leave home and go and find something elsewhere but because I found my passion at home in a way Worthing gave me my career I feel like I owe it something I don't know I love it I'm very lucky that my family live there I was born and bred on the seafront my two brothers live there I have it, all the feelings of growing up as a kid I can park along the seafront for free the access is great you know th these sorts of things are becoming less and less um, visible in the world of kiting you're starting to have to pay for things so I I really owe it to that place I don't owe it I just I just really appreciate what it gave me so going back there and living there has just been great thing I'm able to train there December I had such a good month of training like really it was the best month I think I've ever kite ever I got off the water and thought oh my god that's the best kite I've ever had in my life you know and that was at Incredible. my home spot so obviously I love places like Cape Town and sandy turquoise and palm trees is kind of the norm in kiting especially when you're traveling but it's just so different at home and I, I like the stormy days and the the grass where we kite there's, there's something very special about it that will always be it's so easy for, for me to answer i'm often asked where's your favorite spot and it's just worthing like straight up easy no yeah. questions yeah. asked like yeah that's the spot yeah it's funny it's something you always get asked like everyone's always asking me like oh where's your favorite spot in the world and you sort of have to really kind of think about it i guess um i grew up in ramsgate which is quite for kiting but it isn't quite on the same par with worthing you don't get the sea breezes and things like that so you feel like you need to travel a bit more to get conditions the year round and I guess like when you're sort of starting out in kiting you've got these um, mentors and icons and people that you're looking up to I remember very early on in your career you'd only been kiting like a year or something and wasn't it a two years maybe and you won the British Championships or something it was like the most ridiculously short amount of time and I think for me as someone that works in the industry as an editor that really was the light bulb moment of how easy kiteboarding is to get into if you dedicate yourself to it and how not easy it is to learn those tricks but if you've got that willpower and that mentality you really can you know in windsurfing you couldn't windsurf in three years and become the British champion it just would not happen it took years and years and years of like learning and training and training and then here's this young upstart Lewis who's suddenly beating all these guys that have been doing it for a long, longer period of time, you know, how did that kind of come about? I think there was a number of variables that went in my favour for that. Actually, I think one, the sort of influence I'd had by the springboards and trampolines, and it was, I was so aerially aware. aware of what was going on. You know, I can do double flips, even triples off the top board at the swimming pool. I really know my way around 
uh, upside Spatial down. Awareness yeah, and I something. think the other major thing that happened was the the sport had changed massively during the time I got into it. Literally, as I got into the sport in 2003, 2002, 2003, the sport went from big air and board offs. I mean, my boards literally changed in sizes in six months. I remember first signing up with RRD and I wanted a 110. Yeah, yep. that's one one zero centimeters board. Tiny that's what I've been riding. Ride, yeah. Fiberglass. I'd been using a lost cause board that I'd been sorted, and they didn't do anything smaller than a one one five RID, and I was devastated. I was like, oh, I can't, I can't ride this. So it's not. And then within a year, I was riding a one twenty six, then a one thirty six, then a one thirty eight, and it the boards all design got designed for landing harder. Basically, the wake style progression happened. Handle passes. I mean, yep. we were doing scent handle passes at the time, but we were tying windsurf leashes down our backs. Every time I missed a bar, I lost a kite. And I'd go <laughs> back into the shop, boost it was at the time, and they'd make me a new leash, and it would snap every time. I don't know if that was a clever <laughs> sales tactic or what, or maybe we just didn't have the equipment, but it was. It became all about handle passes, and, and I think because I was young, I sort of was a bit more fearless about that, and I think the older generation which was i mean the bk say was the, that's like british mike tour. smith at the time the and british tour like was that. dominated by guys in their 30s yeah you like know. dave ibby and and i was one of the first teenagers if you like to get into it so that that was just a bit of luck i suppose at the same time i was also very fortunate that a guy like aaron was doing the world tour yeah had he been at home doing the british tour which would have been a very different result so i sort <laughs> of seized that opportunity and i with my competitive nature as a sportsman i was like i've really got a a shot of this and I actually won the, it was the kiteboard British tour yep. which is the um, the tour I won in 2005 and then after that I won the BKSA three years in a row 2006 7 and 8 but to give you an indication of how quick things changed with age groups I've entered the my competition scene as the youngest rider I think on the British tour and then by the time I stopped in the end of 2008 I was the oldest rider on the tour so that's how quick it had stopped. But I think I was about 21 or 22 when I won my last one, and suddenly I was the oldest guy. That, that was such a quick change in age. Quite a massive paradigm shift, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I guess you're right. I hadn't thought about that before, that the actual sport changed, and you were, you know, they often say where there's change, there's opportunity. And if you have, like, you know, in business, you've got these huge brands doing, you know, they own the market or whatever, but then as soon as the market changes, there's always opportunity for someone new to come along, like a little bit like Sony with cameras, you know, the market's mm. changed from digital SLRs to mirrorless cameras and they came in, changed the game and they've led it. So I guess for you at that point, you had that opportunity of, well, the sport's changing, so everybody's as at this one level again where they're all trying to learn to do these new tricks rather than, oh, I've got to get as good at them as the old tricks that they've been doing for years and years. Yeah, I suppose I didn't have all of that programmed into me big air and even jumping into big air jumps and board offs so I, I was actually really getting into that i was really <laughs> amazed by that the height was the reason i'd got into kiting you know so in a way i had to put that on the back burner for quite some years which sort of relit my love for big air eventually which we'll go into but those early years was like very simply put i wanted to be the best at the unhooking movement and that was all i was driven by was my competitive nature to just be the best and that eventually got quite challenging with guys like Sam Light coming along, Ali Barrett, Robin Snuggs, Luke Whiteside, you know some of these guys have entered the king of the air you know that haven't done for a while. Sam Light obviously done every single event so far and gone on to incredible things and we have had some really amazing riders, Tom Court was there you know suddenly all these young kids, I say young kids to me it felt like that, they yeah. had their parents at the event, I was 18 and driving, 19 driving my van and old cars at the time and, and I, they were being driven around by yeah parents. and i think that was difficult for me my parents were a bit worried about my choice of career which wasn't really a career at the time it was barely making ends meet a lot i really struggled then but i didn't care about money all i wanted to do was kite and I, prove to them that i could be good at it and so in a way i sort of shut myself off to the other guys i found it i was a bit jealous of their support of their parents and you know i could barely afford the entry fee in fact, I designed the posters for the events to cover my my entry fee. I learned a lot about trying to make things happen there, but I did almost make them all the enemy, and I was <laughs> never spoke to them. You know, it helped me in a way from a competitive nature. Let's give you that motivation. To I've, beat I've them. learned to understand why I was like that, and now it's great that I get on with them all so well. And I think we look back at really fun times on the tours together. Yeah, there was always quite a good little scene on those BKSA tours back in the day. It kind of 
shifted a little bit. Was it hard for you when you won it three times? And then after that, you know, you've been British champion three times. You've got all these young kids coming up and getting to a level where, you know, you're now not going to beat them because they've got better than you. And there's a whole load of them as well. So it's not just like one person you've got to beat. There's quite a few. Was it quite hard almost like going into the sort of wilderness of like, where do I go now? I've done the British tour. What's next for me? Massively. Yeah. I think I actually went through a moment of actually thinking this is the end of it. I found it really difficult to think, right, I've won these championships all now in a row. There was a moment where I was doing, I was always doing odd jobs as well. You know, I couldn't afford to just stay at home and maybe like some of the younger guys could that were under 16 and quite rightfully were able to live at home and were still at school. You know, I yeah. was out there and my parents wanted me to pay rent like my other brothers were, even though it was very minimal, it was still have trying to, to and I get it. giving though. you an idea about the exactly. value of money. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I understand that. And I didn't back then. I was quite hard on them and I moved out at, 1920 and didn't speak to them for six months or so and was doing all these odd jobs and I remember one job working in Wembley Stadium where I was lay- laying flooring actually <laughs> and you used, to, you used to have to pick up this flooring just about you could hold it between you and another guy lay it and you do in the tens of thousands of pieces and it was all around the track and I sat there thinking that this was the arena where the, the, the best British football players would play their football and I was there as the best British kite surfer and I was laying the flooring and it was like a major Something's gone wrong moment here. and it really and I use it a lot when I speak to kids I've got a great photo of me sitting there with a cup of tea and I use that as a moment to to tell young people that there are times you have to really do things you don't want to do to know where you want to get and I sort of sat there and was like this isn't this can't be where this is going you know like that was the year after my third um, BKSA um a title so that, that they were really powerful moments for me in my life ironically at that one i signed in as gary neville one morning and got <laughs> booted straight out of the job it got like really high security deal i thought it was funny and then i was removed off that job like <laughs> and i spent the whole day in a hotel like and i'd been absolutely chained by the boss and i was just like what you know i never really appreciated the, the sort of the serious seriousness sort of, of real work in a way i suppose yeah but you were having to do it to make ends meet and to be yeah i was having to do it in. i didn't do a lot of it i did you know one or two days here and there but all i wanted to do was kite i was absolutely driven by being as good as i could be but that was i think 2009 was the year i stopped competing on the british tour and that was a big thing because i just signed all my small contracts in the uk actually i'd like to mention that guy's name graham fuller was a brilliant guy to me i still get on with him great he was, he was very, surf sales at the time he really he cared about me as a rider that wanted to you know achieve the best i could in the sport and supported me way beyond i think what i i or any kiteboarder deserved at that time you know he gave me a way to pay my rent and it helped me with the van same with rrd i should mention valter as well and jay that really supported me in the early days as well they really believed in me and could see i was passionate and accepted i was an arrogant little <laughs> 17 18 year old that thought i was really good at kiting and i you know they they looked past that and saw the big picture and i really appreciate that so i'd anyway i'd signed my stuff for 2009 that didn't exactly say i'd do the tour but i think i was expected to and i just i think just before the first event which i went to i thought no actually i'm probably not going to hold these kids down any longer <laughs> it's probably time to move on whilst i'm on the top uh that was the year that sam um won it i think was that it, the driving force behind it you were like was it like oh i've had enough of competing or was it more like i've won it three times i'm not gonna win it four or it's gonna be a real struggle to win four i should bow out when I'm i should on top. yeah i think it was like i think it's time to stop while i'm ahead that was more the drive i think i could have been competitive but he's you know sam was on another level back then i was lucky to win not lucky, but the year before in Brighton where it, somehow a storm blew up near the final of our heat, which made a big decider. He lost the kite or something. I got very fortunate Gifted. with that, you know. <laughs> like, like, in a way, I had sort of surprised myself that I'd won that and was like, right, now it's time to move on. And there was also another opportunity to start commentating. Not a massive one, but I saw a chance to speak on the microphone at the events and eventually that led to a big passion of mine, which is broadcasting and live stream and presenting and speaking so that was really good so actually i did get involved in something that i was really into that year which was speaking and then and then actually along came the first of my peer journeys with jake's grace my friend in worthing 
which sort of saved the year, if you like. That I jumped the pier in November, I think it was, or December. Was that 2009 or 2000? 2000? That was 2009. Yeah. The next year was Brighton Pier. But that, that just really saved my ass as far as a couple of sponsors wondering what I'd done in the year. I'd never done it for that. I was sort of completely taken back by the Because you'd always looked at Word in Pier. I remember you sort of Naturally, saying, Naturally, I think... It's where you always kite, it's there. You're always jumping big and you always just wondered, could you? It was such a big part of my life, Worthing Pier, because it is the central divide of my town. It splits east and west completely. I grew up on the east. I then moved to the west when I was 20. I spent my younger years on there on the new amusements, playing games. My grandparents took us there. I spent my teenage years jumping off it, getting in trouble, which you should not do, by the way, <laughs> with the life. You know, I really... And then there was an a, a, a underage nightclub that we'd go to. Does that sound weird, underage nightclub? Like a, a nightclub juvenile for people that aren't 18. Yeah, yeah <laughs> there was a nightclub on the end. So my early teenage years and under 20s, it became a big moment. And completely naturally, on a downwinder from West Worthing to East Worthing or Lansing, you would pass the pier. And every time you jumped, you'd be looking straight over it. And it was Jake and myself that just one day just did it. It was that simple. We, I, I just about messaged someone that had a camera that might be able to film it and that was it we just went and did it and it was really pure and natural and there was no there was never any we're going to get exposure out of this and it's going to change our lives it was a real simple we wanted to do that because it hadn't been done and jake actually went straight away he, he literally turned up went straight away i really admired that with him <laughs> i said to a camera guy I'm gonna this, look this is the bit. time i'm going to do it because there's a big clock on the pier so that they were ready and unfortunately for jake they went he went straight over, nailed it, and the guy hadn't ever filmed kiting. He hadn't just jumped the straight out. out the shot. He jumped so big, he went straight out the top of the frame. And then I went 15, meters, 15 minutes later, and they captured my one. And, that, and then it went really... It was a really fun journey, that. That was a crazy journey of people phoning, and my little Nokia was going. And I was like, wow, this is really exciting. I was really excited. It was just an exciting moment that week. Because I think kiting, to me... Or as far as I had experienced, hadn't been recognised by anybody within the kiting industry. I'd spent three, four years as number one in England and barely got a sentence in a paper. And then doing just a one-minute jump, not even, had gone all like, over. It just changed all the coverage I'd ever got in like that time. So that was that was a big eye-opening moment for me that it didn't necessarily have to be competitions that I did that was a moment where I realized actually there might be another way to make it because I pretty much had given up on it then I suppose or started to think about normal work and yeah you know, what are you going to do beyond that yeah. when you're not competing yeah and then I remember we spoke after you did the big one which was Brighton Pier yeah and you spent quite a long time planning that and thinking about that one and that was almost I remember you said afterwards that it was almost like a do or die if I don't jump over it I'm not going to keep my sponsorships and things are going to be yeah. that's kind of the end for me as a career and it was a similar position I'd been in in 2009 where the Worthing Pier thing had saved it and then I found myself in the same position I just started to toy a little bit with doing some talks in schools and things like that but I still hadn't really you know had a stable income or anything like that I still loved kiting and did a few of the world tour events but never you know, you know, ninth, I think, was a great result for me. I was never at the level where certainly Aaron and Tom, Tom finished top 10 all the time, you know. It was, we had good guys up there, so it didn't warrant the bit of money that I would get from sponsors to go and do them. So I became incredibly obsessed with the idea of doing Brighton Pier since the day I did Worthing Pier, because I didn't do it first, you know. I wasn't the first guy to go over Worthing Pier, so I... Looked at, I knew the next opportunity was that one, and I really became so obsessed with it. It completely took over my life. Like it was, that was quite a amazing part of my life too. And I really surprised myself when I did that. I never really fully expected to do it. I think, but I put myself in the right place that I would make a decision. That I think that's what's important. A lot in life, actually is to just see how you do things at the time. At least make all the ingredients work to put yourself in that position. So, like you said, it was another big moment in my life where I think people would... I think the second time it had happened, people took it serious, more seriously. It wasn't just a one-off thing. It was like, oh, here's kiting again, and it's a bigger, 
it's a, it was a bigger location. Everybody knew Brighton Pier, and I think that really it's helped it. Like, I, I meet loads of people that generally know Brighton if they've been to England and have gone to Brighton and walked on the pier. So people knew about it, and that again gave me a bit of um, um, you know, a bit of a push, I suppose. So that attracted more sponsors, and that that was the moment where I was like, I can make it now as a kiter if I think about what I do and think about you know again the exposure blew my mind on that it was crazy it was well, it was huge it was wasn't amazing. it and the amount of views on the videos it was and so amazing I mean, it was ridiculous and people well. still still talk about it I mean it's nearly 10 years ago and people still talk about it and yeah. I get people who don't even kite surf who come to me going you know telling me kite surf oh shoot that guy that jumped over the pier and I'm like yeah I'm friends with him he's a really yeah. nice guy you know and they're like what years, yeah. you're friends with him oh my god yeah. that's amazing but yeah almost 10 years that it's defined me actually in a big way as part as a big air guy and as you know I teach people how to jump which is the most pure unique thing about kiteboarding to me is the ability to jump in the air and that kind of gave me Mr. Jump credentials because I did a jump, you know, over a thing. It was, And it also helped people understand it, like my parents, I think, for example, who don't know kiting, probably thought the Worthing Pier thing was a bit one-off and then they just, it's just so clear. It's some, I think human humans understand a person flying over a thing in some yeah. way or another. And it's it like just, motocross. It just made it buses. that simple. Mm. It was like that person's going over a thing, that's that's it that's what it does so it sort of helps simplify the sport of kiting and and i can't believe my luck now we, i'm at big air there's a big air tour there's everything's gone back to big air i mean we we do have very defined disciplines in the sport and that's right but i really feel like the discipline of big air like i'd mentioned at the start was forgotten about for some stage there was there was a whole period where if you had your kite high and you sent a jump you were you yeah, know, not cool. Idiot. Yeah, that wasn't the thing to do. You had to keep your kite on the floor, and it was all low-level tricks. And you know, it was kind of it was a shame, really, because it went into this sort of wilderness years of everything was super low and technical, and it was hard for people to understand and sort of see it. So yeah, I think that. And even the gear was designed not to jump. That, it wasn't yeah. designed to jump. <laughs> now we're having gear designed to jump and get us airborne more than ever. So I really count myself as fortunate that the 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 way that certainly my journey's gone. There's now events that cater for guys like me that just love to jump big so i'm i'm really lucky like that i suppose that it went that way <laughs> perhaps those big jumps hope to help to influence it i hope but it's probably helped me it's helped it's helped me a lot that i really enjoy that part of the sport and, and the wake style stuff i still like that stuff but it's um i felt i needed to train more for that stuff you know yeah. like it's certainly now that things have become a bit more big area orientated as far as some of the big events like king of the air it's helped me to really um, appreciate and respect the riders that do all the disciplines. Yeah. There's riders here like Sam Light, uh, Carlos Mario is actually here as well. Aaron likes his different disciplines. Jesse, I mean, th this guy's doing like big wave surfing in Jaws, but can just suddenly switch disciplines and be one of the best guys in the world at it. Like, I'm very one discipline orientated, you know, like I'm just nailing my turns on a foil you know <laughs> like I'm not <laughs> by any means an all-rounder in the yeah. sport and I look at you know guys like Kevin as well they just it's magic that they can they're the guys I respect the most in the sport right now the because ones, they're so multi-talented across just, all different they're just, classes yeah they're not just good at the other disciplines they're like world bests at other disciplines so I really admire those guys Aussie's another guy that does it just not in the event this year Julian Kerr is another guy that I might not have appreciated back in the day but now i'm just like in all of these guys that in another discipline i look like a beginner and they look like you know amazing like i think that takes a lot to be able to do that like yeah. you and jasper's another guy that switches to mega loops and big air like just like it's nothing you know like I kind of wonder if i should be better at other disciplines. <laughs> <laughs> do you find it hard sometimes with the peer jump that it's kind of you know it has defined who you are and do you find it hard to get away from? You know, I almost feel bad asking about it because it's 10 years ago and you must have been asked about it a million times and you've done so many TV interviews, but yeah, I couldn't do a podcast with you without asking about it. Does that sometimes become difficult for you where you're like, oh, let's not talk about the pitch No, again. not at all. Like, if I'm honest, I absolutely love it that the idea that it might have made someone happy that they saw that. And I've had people come to me and say, I got into kiting because I saw that jump. And that's like... Phenomenal. Such a, an unexplainable moment to... To, to feel because it is compared to these big sports you know I love football I watch football and the amount of fans that watch it and this sort of thing I very much compare kiteboarding to these other major mainstream sports it's quite a small thing and it's those 
little reminders to me when someone sends me a message saying about how their kid was at an assembly I did and now wants to fly a kite. They're like really, I really value all of those messages massively because I was, I was that kid at 17 that was looking up to other people. Like I really try to remember my roots and how I started like that. So those little moments where people talk about stuff are like, they're, they're beyond words to me how that feels. So I never am bothered by that. Like the, I think the other thing that sort of, funny enough sort of reignited my career was the crash as well <laughs> that was actually as good as another peer jump that yeah. was the amount of exposure i got off that crash because well, the like, thing i was going to ask you before we get onto the crash was that when you did the peer jump there was a lot of talk about oh, what's next what's he going to jump mm. over next you know is he going to go and jump over the eiffel tower or you know what's next and i remember we chatted about it and you were off mic i think you said definitely like no yeah. like i don't want to be defined by nearly killing myself because it was like life and death you said mm. to me like one little thing could have gone wrong and you'd have flown into that pier at 30 miles an hour or something and that would have been it. Yeah. So for you at the time, I think you were like not wanting to, but have you ever been pushed by your sponsors or been asked what you're doing next or are you going to do another big thing or have you managed to just sort of... I've been offered money to do things like from big name brands that I won't mention, especially during that time or the next few years, which saw an opportunity to have some young guy just go for the money and do something else. And I considered it, you know, it was a, I'd, I'd say it was a life changing amount of money back then, but it was it worth it? Was, was it, it worth was, dying was over? It worth my life yeah. to, to do it. And actually, that was never the core reason I did those things. And I think that would have been a risky thing and not true to myself if I'd have gone to do that just to brand up and do it. That was, there was all sorts of complications with how they could brand it as well which actually became more or less, you just have to do it and don't ask questions. And, you know, no one ever wanted to sign anything, you know. So I think I sort of moved away from that as they would, those two things which done really well for me were just purely out of straight driven passion. Yeah, no because other you wanted to do them. You I wanted being to do it. And, and it. actually, I think Nick asked me a question on when I was speaking to him on a podcast. He said, would you have done it again if no one filmed you? And I actually had said yes back then and I thought about that a long time and the answer should have been no is that it wouldn't have mattered it was that I had done it you know like I'd have been guided not to have seen it again and that's the world we live in now where everyone wants to film and take a picture of something because they want to show someone else they want to relive the moment that's yeah. why people are obsessed with capturing something and not actually really Enjoying valuing moment. that moment which was what I did that for so the answer should have always been that I would never have minded, but it, it is that, is that I've done those things for me to carry the rest of my life, that every time I drive to Brighton and go shopping with my partner or do those <laughs> things, I look at the pier and think, think yeah, I did that. that. I did that, I, and it was a big, it had more of an effect on the rest of my life and the way that I think mentally that I could really achieve something if I really put my mind to it for a year than it did, than, you know, making some money or doing something like that. I'd be lying if I said that there weren't crazy thoughts that go through my mind where I see a location or, or you know, I've I've tra trawled the whole world on Google Maps and Earth looking at special places and thinking what could be done. And I think that's in my makeup, especially with a sport like kiting, where there's so many new opportunities to do things where, I mean, you only have to look what Nick's done. And that's I think he has the same makeup where he's thought, what can I do with a kite? Like, it, it never leaves you those ideas but now that I'm a bit older and I have responsibilities and two cats and a loving partner and you know things I think it, those sorts of things get in the way but your mind is constantly thinking about those things especially when those storm days hit you're aware of how yeah. for me how high you can go and there's and I think that never leaves you as a that that's a real challenge for me that's like challenging myself to the ultimate level mentally and physically so those thoughts still happen do you think devices like the Woo have probably helped you in the sense that before you were measuring yourself about what can I jump over, now you don't have to jump over something. You can have the British record or you can work towards beating your friends and things like that. So it's kind of taken away that need to say, oh, there's something I want to see if I can get over it. Uh, actually, I've got a device on my kite board that tells me how high I've gone. Yeah, I do. I think massively because you still can compete not only against everyone else, which is a special thing, but you can still compete with yourself, Yeah, I guess. So that is a challenge that you don't have to add the risk to, you know. But I'm still, I love how the community has been built 
by what I've seen so many amazing stories and people I speak to that might I never might have known if it wasn't for the woo and them connecting with me but I still have a part of me which values the the magic in not knowing as well and I think that's where those jumps fall in that they I kind of always have liked that I couldn't measure that jump I'm often asked how high was it you know and you could kind of work out on photoshop but there's still a part of me that values that that magic I mean everyone must have a guy on the beach that is that guy that's like oh I jumped 30 meters today you know and the woo kind of you know shut those guys up a bit <laughs> like they're the ones that didn't buy it after that you know like so I kind of like I, I never forget those people and I think in me as well is that I do like to know and it's nice to know and have that community aspect but sometimes it quite can be special to post a picture and not provide the data to you know yeah it's a balance it's a balance but a balance I think that we've got right and that you don't um you don't sort of interact with the device on the water you can do now with the watch and things like that but for me once you bring technology out on the water it can interfere take a gopro for example if i need to go and get pictures with a gopro and have it on a line mount and have a remote on my wrist my my way and my routine of going onto water is instantly out of sync you know like i'm putting the lines on it's not going on the line mount i put it on the wrong way the remote's not working it's just you get hassle. home, you've had a great day on the water, and then you look at all it. All the footage and, is rubbish. Oh, it's it always it. a drop on there, and you can somehow have a bad day, even you've had a good day. I remember one moment here where I saw it's an amazing moment of what a, a mother whale and its calves. How do you call a mother whale? I don't know. Yeah. And, a, and its calves. A whale and its calves. Yeah, <laughs> and I had the GoPro, and I went right out to it, and I had to really chase it upwind. There was not much wind. I had to run up the beach, go out, and then I was just too far downwind. Go back, run up the beach. Ran all the way past from the main circle here to past Dolphin in the end to get this line to get it. Got home, you know, I was just, mate, I could always touch them, you know, and I got yeah. home. And what I'd done, eventually I was like, how is it not on there? And what I'd done is pressed on when I thought it was off or something like that. So I'd, actually so the moment off. of when I was there getting the selfies and all that on the video, I'd actually turned it off yeah. and turned it on. As, <laughs> as you are riding back. Yeah, yeah, and that that devastated me so much. I was so devastated, even though I'd, Whereas actually it's the most magical I, thing that could happen, that you've enjoyed it in the moment. But I think I was so focused on wanting to share it that yeah. I hadn't appreciated the moment myself. So that these all little lessons... The kind of this, that's sadly the world that we live in now because everyone's sharing everything. Mm. It's that phrase, isn't it? Picks or it didn't happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. and the thing is it did happen. It did happen and it was wonderful and I can't believe I had any moment on that day of feeling down and I was devast I was depressed as <laughs> hell, like, what an idiot, how have I done that, you know? So just going back to that technology in the water thing, it's a very fine balance I think and that's where we got it right uh, to start completely because they just you didn't you don't know it's there. Yeah. I love the moment where I'd get home and be have a bath and be like, right, I'm gonna upload it. I'm now gonna see what the day was. It didn't interfere with that routine and I think that was But then equally you can go, What well, I thought I was jumping way higher than that and it's yeah, come up can... really low and now I'm really annoyed because yeah. my mate jumped higher <laughs> and he than definitely me. Did and then yeah. it just devastates you yeah. anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny. But I think as long as you don't take it too super seriously. serious and you can enjoy the I mean the real value of that thing is how it's connected communities and put leaderboards together and you know i know it's got a lot of people back into kiting exactly like yeah, even foilers that... can jump with it and there's all sorts of amazing ways to award people and do events and, and it's brilliant yeah it's good and we're at the king of the air at the moment a waiting period started that's an event you've been kind of you've done every single one i think you were telling me in the other cape day town. in cape yeah. town yeah so ever since it's reborn you've been here and I think it's only Sam Light that's got that same accolade because other people have missed it because of injury or they've not been invited or whatever. Um, is that your sort of main focus in competi competition for the year? Is like King of the Air is always the pinnacle for you now? King of the Air is the number one event that I really want to do my best at and I'm destined to win it one year, I believe. <laughs> I don't know. The, odds, you know, the odds have got to work got out close. sooner or later. I did get close last year, but I, I don't think I'd prepared well enough for that scenario it was like a 25 knot final and i had a 10 meter dice that i'd never used there and now i've spent a lot of time trying, trying to use lighters. that in case it gets like that you know i'm realistic in the this is the seventh year that we've run the event and something like 82 percent of the events have been 25 knots you know like the, the one year it was epic i'd done myself in the semi-final was <laughs> really that's the most relaxed i've ever been i was so in a good 
place. I'd beaten Aaron in the quarterfinals. I'd, I'd just, you were, I, I, I remember really, watching that on the live stream. Just, and like just thinking, was, like, Lou's going to win this. I was really up for you it. You looked then, like the easily the most. I you were it. jumping the highest. You were doing the biggest loops. You looked so yeah. solid on the water. I was like, you got this in the bag. And that was only two weeks after I'd moved brand as well. And I'd really got used to my new gear. It's where I am now with Duo Tone, the same gear. I felt so good about everything. So it took me a long time to get over that, like to forgive myself for that so mistake. Because like, remember chatting about, the, the, and this is the crash that we're talking about, mm-hmm. which is the other sort of major defining point of your life, I guess. And I remember I asked you about it and you just said, well, I don't remember it, so it doesn't really affect me. But now you're saying actually the the real effect of it was the frustration at not Maybe yeah. taking the King of the Air crown that year. I had a big opportunity that year. And I think that looking back, now I've had time to really process it. I was like, I thought I'd done this double megalit. I, my mind went crazy after that with drugs. I was only in the hospital. I really wasn't right for quite a while, like way longer than I think I admitted to myself. I'm talking like a year, you know, like it really didn't all just pan out until things were back to normal. But what I thought would happen hadn't happened as far as me doing a new move which wasn't even really possible <laughs> and then when I watched the video back I was kind of just thought, oh, really like that's how I done it you know like it was a real one-off thing where I landed backwards and because the kite just I mean head. let's just for people that haven't seen it I mean I'll put a link to the video and people can watch it and it's pretty horrific but basically the kite just kind of stalled didn't it and you just there were a couple came of variables that, goodness that, knows that where. influenced that crash and the, first and foremost there was a pilot error like that was that was the hard thing for me to accept at the start as soon as I saw the kite position I was like I made an error you know like that's what I didn't think had happened and then the other variable looking back at the data is I hit arguably the biggest gust of the day on that nine meter so I I was in an unnatural position as I went up which I'd slightly rotated I hadn't lost it into a mega spin I just the wave had just broken pushed me I'd say not even 90 degrees further around than not maybe 90 degrees so i was still tucked going up felt really good tension because that's all these loops are about is feeling good tension and body position which is that's how you can do a front or a boogie loop you don't see the kite you just feel it on the way up you like feels good to pull the pull the trigger so the same thing happened with that and i ended up in a really unusual position which was sort of uh, best described as an upside down toilet seat position if you can imagine that was a position that had somehow gone through my mind weeks before as a new position you could probably get in you know and I've actually seen Joshua do it a bunch of times where you, you slightly end up in a back roll and it's a very strange position to end up in and I pulled it and then this weird thing happened where I didn't rotate one way I actually had thought from that position oh, I'll throw a back roll which is sort of the go-to easier move of mega loops these days so I threw that but because I didn't start from a square on position I didn't generate a nice full back roll swing I'd sort of didn't have much to throw against it because I'd done 90 degrees already and then came this like am I going left am I going right which way am I actually rotating and generally in kiting that you come out one way or the other it's like a cat I like to say landing on its feet it always lands on its feet yeah and I couldn't find a way and the pilot error that had happened then so I'd hit the biggest gust so that would cause my kite to stall a little bit the piloting error is that I put too much weight on my backhand and this is most commonly found in things like back rolls yeah when you first learn your back roll you can wham yourself into a back roll kite loop and that's because you're trying to manipulate your body via arm power rather than all of our good movements in mega loops come from the core and they come from the chicken loop and i'm a very big believer in fingertips being on the bar so i actually had used my body a bit to try and manipulate my rotation which actually brought the kite one and a quarter around so it done a full loop and then another quarter which was towards the beach and at the last second i i must have realized because i shot the kite straight back up to 12 and it just didn't catch me but at that moment i was convinced that i'd still fix it never saw the landing and that was i think that's why you get a knockout is a back a back on you don't see it coming whereas a, at least a front edge you can as we saw in the event the other day with the girls where rose took a few front ones She's, I think your mind can calculate you must have hit something forward because you saw it. So that's what happened. And then I, but I don't remember any of the aftermath. I don't remember. I remember very briefly waking up in the life-saving place, like on a little bed in there. I've since been in there and lied on that bed. I do it every year just to sit there and think about it and, and it's helped me process it. But as far as the effect on me, it, it was very minimal because I didn't remember the... 
I've never seen someone in that position. You know, I saw all the pictures of guys like friends of mine, Aaron and Ruben, like really almost in tears about what they were seeing. But I've yet to experience that in somebody that I love or, or you know, appreciate as a friend. So I've, I can't sympathise with it. I've been, I've had a lot of difficulty sympathising with my my girlfriend and my my mum, for example, rings me a lot now because it's King of the Air and she has feelings come up for the event and I've really almost apologised to her and said, oh, I'm so sorry, I can't appreciate what this is like for you because to me this is my job and my passion and I'm convinced that I'm invincible because you have to be to do this stuff. You really do have to, in a way, almost lie to yourself and go out there like, right, I'm invincible. I'm, yeah, nothing's going to And that's part of it. So it was quite a roller coaster of a journey, but on the on the plus side the level of exposure was great <laughs> it was like a peer, well, it another a, peer jump it was like borderline i mean you were dead for a bit technically yeah, weren't was you? it good it was good exposure like, I, I don't know all remember what they say all exposure all exposure is good exposure, is good exposure. Yeah. it doesn't matter when people are dissing us on the yeah. forums <laughs> then was like oh, have you seen this they're having a real go at your magazine yeah. i'm like it's good exposure yeah, i don't care yeah. Great, yeah yeah as long as you're talking about me it doesn't matter what they're saying but i mean it was it was pretty hard to watch i guess from the outside but i guess you're kind of shielded from it because you're in it you know it's not mm. something that that bothers you too much because you're the person that's you I know, was, as soon as in I the woke moment. up I was like what's the problem I'm fine and they were like you know you, you really aren't fine you, you're and you'd, they, support, you'd knocked you know? yourself out and you'd swallowed a lot of water and yeah. would drown I don't think my heart had ever stopped and that, that had never happened no one had to resuscitate me it was just full of water and I think I owe that down to being a sportsman and that my body was fit enough to the small just oxygen keep. that I had and I also have to spit, say my appreciation to Renault and Andres, who got to me yeah, and they helped got you me. Really quick. Well, the actual real saviour of that was my kite. It just because it was facing towards the beach, it just kept on pulling me in the right And direction. even took off in the air and was pulling me back to the beach. So there was a number of factors that really helped with that. But I'm really happy that it was me that helped to shine a spotlight on safety. I think I've been able to use that and help push. Because that was something we spoke about at the time. Because I remember I, I sort of watched these events and I just think. I remember watching that event and I was like, wow, this is like, it's it really massive. windy. Yeah. It's really windy and everyone is going super big. And I think, you know, Lasse had a bit of a yeah, mix up. Heat was it before me, I think. Heat God, before you, he just me. like had a bit of a thing. Same and it was like, thing. is this starting to get dangerous now? And with mountain biking that we work in a lot, you know, we watch um, Red Bull Rampage, which is kind yeah. of the pinnacle of that event. And yeah. they're doing backflips over hundred foot canyons. And you're yeah. like, I watch these things. I think someone is going to die. Yeah. It's going to get to that point where someone dies on live TV yeah. because Red Bull have made it happen because mm. they're pushing them athletes into these areas that are potentially, you know, life and death. Yeah. And I think you were the person that got the closest to that in yeah. kiteboarding, certainly. And it was hard for me to kind of watch and process because I know you was a friend. I was miles away. I was in the Caribbean watching it on the live stream, but it was still hard to process. And I remember we talked about it afterwards and I was just like, you know, are we reaching a point where we have to stop as a sport and think, is this the direction we want to push it? Or should we be thinking more about safety? And we chatted a little bit about helmets and impact vests and things like that. And it's something that you've become quite passionate about now. I mean, you don't go out without an impact vest on no, I most don't. days, I, really. Yeah, I, and that's kind of a debate between the guys. Some say it holds them back with the handle passes and things that gets in the way. There's definitely a bunch that feel that it's something that they don't shouldn't be made to wear. And I, I kind of accept that. It should be your own responsibility it's not been proven that an impact vest is going to save any of this stuff just as a helmet is people call me all sorts of things on my social media feeds i don't wear helmets but i've also been led to believe they might be just as dangerous if they snagged or give me whiplash so until it's physically proven that this is going to help that i do think i mean we are mandatorily have to wear the impact vest and i believe it would help me whether or not it would have saved me in that crash, I don't know, but I don't think so. I think that was, I mean, I, even in bindings, people often say, oh, the bindings did it. I came straight out of the bindings <laughs> like that, and I was in them hard, you know, I must have hit hard. I was straight out of the bindings. So we're not to know, unless it's scientifically proven that one thing helps another, but definitely what we do know is that the level of safety wasn't at its best and i mean the, the safety here now is that i really have to say I mean, the ski, they had a ski on the water didn't they but it didn't get near on the you water, i oh, was it not on the water was, happened? i, I thought it was like it was upwind miles away or it something it never but, came into the picture yeah. but now i have to say it's absolutely impeccable the safety meeting done here is done and it's wrapped up in 10 minutes they're like this is the plan you've got two jet skis we've got a swimmer on the back there we even have a boat stationed out there with a medic 
on the boat, we have a crash flag, it's so absolutely meticulous now, there's never even a question, we're just like, well they got that covered, and the head guy at the life saving centre that I've got to know really well, Derek's a lovely guy, and he orchestrates these crossings, people swim across to Robin Island, and he, he actually does swimming uh, crossings of the channel in England, and he's got a really high success rate of people crossing, that's his thing, 66% he's got, most of it's 30%, so he's so into safety, I mean, they're swimming across the channel with ferries and all sorts must be a big deal, but to for them to manage a competition of kiting now with multiple jet skis and guys that can jump, swim off, there's even kiters that are positioned up when that can go in, you, you very much feel like it's, you're almost going to be a hassle if you went in yourself, you know, like you'd naturally yeah. go, and they ask us if you're near go, but if the boat's coming in or jet ski, get out of the way, they know what they're doing, so I'm really happy that i mean it's kind of sad that it had to take one I was gonna say, moments, yeah, that's, a, but that's almost a sad thing that it takes someone nearly yeah, dying for them to stand up i and, think that's quite normal in sport and in human you know nature to only put in stop safes until something happens you know we're, we get, we're getting until, better we get until it goes wrong and then we are getting better at that with the health and safety um thing that's happened in the modern generation but it's just the way it is you know i can only look at a sport like formula one where they now have the halo and this I mean, and that. that's a great example. I know you're mm. a big Formula One fan, as am I. And, and you look at what they've done to sort of protect the athletes in that sport is incredible. And I often think, as a sport of kiteboarding, are we not doing enough? You know, we talk about helmets, and like you said, there's no research into it. Mm. And you look at mountain biking, there's so much research into how a helmet protects you and, you know, what it does. And yet, it's never been done in kiting. No. That's... And it's may be a shame because is it possible that the resources aren't there to commit to well, I'd say 100 percent the resources yeah. probably aren't there but then I, I don't know how i don't know how much it would cost i mean you think how many kites there are two hundred and fifty thousand. if it was proven that you know look at snowboarding mm. and skiing everyone wears a helmet so there's an yeah. opportunity to sell two hundred fifty thousand helmets yeah. that work that are designed specifically but yeah, maybe 250,000 is not a lot. There's probably millions of skiers and snowboarders, so it's that's the difference. It's a difficult subject, isn't it? Because it's, it's, you know, for, certainly for someone like me that's a pro rider that has access to R&D teams and things like that, there's almost part of me that thinks, do I have a responsibility, especially being somebody that's had that happen? And then there's the almost the selfish side of you, which loves to be out there with nothing on and... You know, like I know, yeah. I know. Wind I in your hair, be, or not hair as we are, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I should be wearing ear things, right? Yeah. You know, like that's supposedly good to stop that thing happening in your ear, but I love the sounds of the sea, and I've accepted that I'll do the op when I'm in my 50s and have six months out and get your do, ears drilled. You know, like there's certain things that are, you know, are they selfish things that you could be helping other people? I don't know. It's a difficult, it's a very difficult subject, and. Uh, I think that, that there could be more done to look into the safety of it, but it probably needs us as a whole to come together. We have these big committee meetings with King of the Air, and we do discuss safety and things like that. And, you know, for example, the the impact vest has become mandatory, so it might be on the horizon. But just touching on something you said about the dangers of it and whether or not it's got too far because of the danger of it. Again, I'll use Formula One as a sport where I think people people watch sport because of the inherent danger i don't think formula one would be fun if they were done on tracks where there was such a big runoff area on each corner you know you look at monaco and things like that people have died in formula one it's actually probably a common occurrence if you look at the last 30 40 years they're trying to minimize things where they shouldn't have had to die you know yeah. like fires and things like that but i think people like to watch stuff with danger and that always seems to be yeah. what, what public like what watch. draws people to yeah, it yeah look at you know like you're saying with the the mountain biking and things like that, that stuff's nuts so i watch that and i'm like blimey that's like off the side of a cliff here like <laughs> this is like kiting at least we have water to fall on and stuff yeah. like that so actually as far as this event goes and ruben said it really well in the meeting he said this is the most safe we'll ever be in one of our sessions and it's true we feel we are actually so safe out there now because you're doing this any i mean this is the thing isn't it it's like should you have a competition that glorifies it? Well, you guys are going to do it anyway. Mm. So if there isn't a competition to glorify it, you're still doing it. Yeah. So you might as well have a competition that then allows you to progress and, oh, yeah. and put great. it on the world stage and it gives you a reason for doing it's it. It's great to have a platform where in the back of your mind you think, right, if I really needed to pull something out here in a heat, I'd probably try it there. That's the best place to try it. You're gonna, you know what I mean? That's actually... 
that is providing a platform to bring new moves in it. But again, like you said, is it an influence of a brand that's giving you those ingredients? We all want to be there, I suppose. It's up to us to sign the forms and be there, and we do want to be there, and that's, I suppose that's that at the end of the day. No one's actually making us do that. No, it's all your own choice. Yeah. Do you get well rewarded for being there? Do you think the, the, the reward is worth the risk? I actually don't think the reward is worth the risk at the moment. I imagine you're hinting at financially. Um, are we rewarded financially well enough? Um, I don't think so, but I think that reflects Because, I mean, essentially you're putting your life on the line. Yeah, I think it's so a big thing. So is $5,000 for the win worth, <laughs> worth well, the price of your life when you look at it like that? It's a bit more than that now, but when I... As a competitor, the way I look at it is I look at the whole package. I see massive film crews now i mean like if you've never come and seen king of the air you only have to look at what's happening right now on the beach the event's not going to take place till thursday they've got these massive football style cameras all up the beach they're all practicing their angles cables going hundreds and hundreds of meters you know if not miles along the sand it's such a big setup you've got incredible judges now that probably don't get mentioned enough for how much time they put into it you get all of that's going on but as far as the pay goes to the riders, the split, basically, to put it bluntly, only the top three are actually making money as far as excluding their travel costs to be here. And I don't sit nicely with that. And I finished top three last year. I'm not trying to raise my money as someone that believes I should be in the top half this year. I defend the guys that are new to the event and I don't feel that it's right that the people finishing near the bottom are really if not receiving anything they're just as equally risking their lives and i think that's something i feel passionately about so it should be more of a spread from the top I to the do. bottom and it's not just a complaint like everyday life oh there should be more there should be more money but just like formula one i believe the, the drivers are the ones taking the risk there and they're the ones no matter where they are in the grid they're taking the risk and they're the ones that should be considered on a, a level par with possibly some of the production or the marshals or things like that and i think i think that could change but at the same time, I appreciate this is the one big event of the year where they're showcasing big air and that sort of thing. But I'm always looking out for, I guess, the, the riders, all of the riders, not just the ones at the top. But you're the guys that are making it happen. But then it comes down to, oh, there's not the riders, but go back to the Red Bull Rampage. I've spoken to a few of the guys that run that and they always say that they don't. It's changed now. But there was a period when, you know, they literally, they're there for two weeks, digging it all, making it all happen, putting all the work mm. in and then they get $5,000 for for a yeah. win. It was like a bit of a joke. And if you didn't get third, then you didn't yeah. get anything. Yeah, it was like, hang on a minute, advice. I've just risked my life. I could have ruined my career yeah. for this. And it, it kind of comes down to, you know, making sure that you look after those riders. And the sad thing is, if you decided, right, I don't want to do it anymore because I'm not getting rewarded, there'd mm. be someone step in oh, yeah. like that, willing to do it for nothing. Because then that's the kind of difficult thing as a pro rider that you've got a balance, I guess, that, yeah. you know, you're putting your life on the line, but equally someone's going to jump into your limelight the minute yeah. you step down. So. The opportunity for a rookie to come in and be like, wow, I'm on the scene. And that's why, that's, that's why I think that it could be a bit more um rewarding is that there's so many people that want to be in this event now you only have to look at the video entry there's a lot of good guys that didn't get in that i, I think could have or should have got in it's just so hard to get in this event now you know the riders are down to 18 we used to have almost double that and and, and you know the riders are training all year but we don't just turn up and do this event there's people dedicating a lot of time training to to be able to perform at this level for the show that that's the time that I don't think is seen and put into it. So I'd like to see that change in time. And I'm definitely one of those at the meetings that voices that, but after the event. You know? Yeah. One thing I was just thinking about as well, when we're talking about helmets, without dwelling on it too much, but it's interesting that if you're a kid, you have to wear a helmet in a competition in kite surfing. And then as soon as you're an adult, you don't have to wear a helmet. So you go back to that, oh, were they dangerous? Could it snag? Well, then why are we making kids wear them? Yeah, it is a whole can of worms, but maybe someone listening to this can start thinking about, you know, putting the research and time and development into it. Maybe their brains are more valuable. The way they think hasn't been so. <laughs> yeah, not so quite. set in stone. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one. And then something that's probably quite close to everyone's heart this year. There are a lot of girls putting up entry videos and we chatted about this a little bit beforehand. And they've just done the Queen is Born event, which has been hugely 
successful they had really good win for it and the girls were throwing down like i was impressed with the level like they're stepping up do you think um there should be a queen of the air event happening or do you think the girls should even be allowed to compete against the guys in some circumstances i think in any sport if the it should always be about the level of riders i think it shouldn't even matter the ladies or men I've, i i look at all sports across the board as far as a commentator and someone interested in broadcast of sports, I learn a lot from other sports. Take darts, for example. Recently at home, there was a female that got to the first round, nearly actually knocked out one of the guys, but she was there because she was good enough, you know, and I think that's always got to be the message. I know that we have so many sports like tennis and other sports where it's not possible like that, but I think I, I would have had no problem if there had been a lady that had made it into this event on merit of her videos and that sort of thing that would have been great now if they need and feel it's right to do their own event to push the image of the sport then good on them as well i also witnessed this last event with the girls and and i could not believe how committed they can be in these strong wins it's actually taken back or some of the crashes were like, borderline <laughs> say worse than what i survived well or even didn't survive they actually rode away and done more tricks after that so i think i admire how they organize that I spent a lot of time around the girls that were sat on the computers and made that happen and they really believe in it and I think the only way for them to create more um, awareness of how many of them are into big air is to do things like that. So what's been really nice this year at the King of the Air is the top female riders have been part of all our meetings, they've sat there and have been addressed as equal athletes as we have. They'll be part of the event, at the start of the event they'll go and have some heats and I think this is actually a year where they will consider it to be the start and they've yeah. done that all off their own back so I think they've done really well with that and it won't be long before we get more of them because I think that's the only thing missing now and it's by no means any fault of any of the top girls is there hasn't been enough of them maybe there are loads of them around the world that haven't come and now are like or oh, maybe it's time to come out and do that they need enough of a fleet to run an event yeah. you know I don't can't remember the numbers for the event we just saw. I think it was eight girls entered. So it was yeah, eight, so it's not huge. far off the numbers needed, but I think it's been the start this year, so I, I respect them for that. Yeah, well, hopefully I think that event, people have seen it now, and then, like you say, that will inspire other girls around the world mm. to start thinking, oh, I can throw a mega loop in 35 knots and get level with Mackay, and then they'll start pushing themselves, and then maybe next year you'll find there's a whole load more girls that are at the same sort of level that Angelie's at. Cause well, you look at the other disciplines in kiteboarding, every single one has a discipline. That's, yeah. You know, so this one, it's inevitable it will have that too, but I, I really like the way they didn't accept that and just made their own thing, and actually, you know, there's girls properly representing at the King of the Air event this year for the first time, so that's good, good for them. In the last few years, you obviously changed sponsor and you're now with Duotone. And you mentioned to me earlier when we first met, I think, um, actually at the girls event and we were having a chat and you said you really liked the fact that Duotone were getting behind the big air thing and you felt more part of the team than you ever had before. Is that a happier place for you now that you feel like, oh, I'm being recognised for my talents? Like, Do you feel like you've made it from coming from jumping over the pier and getting all the attention but maybe not getting the monetary reward that one might expect you feel like now you're in a place where you're kind of yep yeah, i'm happy i've got my path i know what i'm doing i've got king of the air every year and i've got the support behind me finally definitely it feels great to have that you know when i see them pushing out videos of um, the international team the lasso and aaron i think wow i'm actually one of the guys that they're you know we're on a whatsapp group where we're going to ride today we're going to shoot right we're going to do this this we're going to have all these different angles and i think because right, i've always been a guy that's kind of done my own thing if you like like i've been part of kiteboarding teams but because of my journey through the sport where i i suppose i do different things than your typical rider that might focus on competition i've, I've found the passion i have for the school work i'm doing and the coaching and commentating i've sort of felt like i've been a bit on my own journey but definitely with the brand I'm with now they support me so much and this sort of projects we have on the go now where they really back in my vision that's my vision of the sport that I love and they're so behind it it does I think the only way to compare it to and what I've been thinking about lately as you might know I'm into golf is I read lots of books on golfers which is Reddy and Poulter's book superb is how he feels when he plays in the Ryder Cup 
there's a feeling that I have at this event, which is not only my own personal projections of what I want to achieve, but it's actually my responsibility to deliver for the team. That that's really a new feeling that's that's come since my move. I mean, I've been with the brand uh, over th nearly three years now. Well, actually, just over three years. But now that we've had this big change, it's it's really enforced this feeling even more. So I really feel like I want to do it for the team as well. You know, so that is a is a really valuable feeling that has, I've felt has lacked over the years with some of the teams I've ridden for. So it's great to have that support. And do you, you know, we can hear the wind picking up now, so I'm going to wrap this up because otherwise you'll be getting itchy again. It's getting windy, Ru's still chatting to me. Are you still just as passionate about it was, you know, back in the early days we talked about you didn't even have a kite board and you'd drive all the way across the country to Whitstable to go body dragging. Do you still have that same buzz when the conditions are on or do you sometimes find it a bit harder to get motivated these days? I still have the same passion for kiteboarding, but it's a passion that's changed, you know, now. Like I, at the start, was very passionate about kiting all day, every day, you know, and that, that was all I wanted to do is improve my riding. But now my passion has changed to different areas of the sport and so some areas of the sport that I think I overlooked possibly when I was a bit younger and wanted to go out and kite for myself. I, I absolutely love, and there are probably areas people wouldn't expect, but I love the process of launching and landing people. I, I really enjoy going to the beach and looking at who needs launching and landing, and, and, and I love that community side to it. That I didn't, you know, when I was a teenager, I wanted to go out first, you know. Like, <laughs> I love rescuing kites. It's like my you know all right it's a nice thing but i don't just do it to be nice i actually love the challenge of trying to get hold of someone's kite and getting it and i love how as kiteboarders that's our community we do that sort of stuff so i think my passions have changed i'm definitely am always going to be out there when it's stupidly windy that's like my my real thing with kiting but i've learned to really appreciate the small aspects of kiting that go often missed you know especially in somewhere like cape town you miss you miss those things if you look at actually what's going on with thousands of kite boarders that are all kiting together you can very easily get angry at how busy it is but in the same regard it's a powerful community to be, to be part of but i suppose the long term answer to your question is that i see myself always involved with this sport in one way or another you know like i'm you know i'm 34 this year I think I'm one of the oldest guys on this competition now, but by no means do I think, you know, there's going to be a time where I change or do something else. Yeah, you keep at it. Hmm. And what's your plan for the competition, aside from win it? <laughs> My plan for the competition is, um, yeah, I'd like to achieve a first place. That would be really nice. I think to enjoy it, it's very easy to get hung up in the day. And you know, I've had so many years of doing this event now, I've really got my routine together, but you you have to enjoy it. You see how many people, this is like party time for people. They all gather together. They, this new spot we've moved to has allowed people to get so near the action, you know, like kites are almost hitting the people on the beach. They slam down and people are all looking at the scores on their phone. And it's, it, it really is important to still enjoy it like I would have done had I been one of those people in the crowd. You know, I went to watch events when I was younger and I, I try and think about it like that too. Obviously, you've got to focus, but you've got to appreciate how special it is to be in this event. It's lucky to be in it, really, aren't you? Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing to still be in it and doing it. And do, do you sometimes like, pinch yourself and just think, what, I was this little kid? Definitely. There's always little, you know, you get on with it as a job and it's what you do. But there's, I do have a lot of moments like where I stay. I stay in this small little shed that's where I've stayed all my life in Cape Town and it keeps me grounded and on the wall in there I have a, a poster of Ruben Lenton who I've drawn in the first heat you know like a, during a competition I was at in 2012 it's on my wall in there and I'm like wow you know I'm competing against one of my major inspirations and idols yeah I do think about that a lot of the time there's never a moment I don't appreciate where I am in the world of kiteboarding and how lucky I've been to travel the world and do all these amazing things you know like I've, I've been very fortunate you know what if what if kiteboarding hadn't happened yeah <laughs> what, where would, you would be? my life have been now I'd, laying I floors know. at Wembley <laughs> Stadium maybe <laughs> no I like to think I'd have found something that I was passionate on but I was who would have thought that on my doorstep that there was just this perfect sport you know that's been amazing fantastic 
Lewis, I think we'll wrap it up there. There's so many things we haven't talked about, but we'll save we that for another, another episode. Yeah. yeah, we'll do another, like all the stuff you do with kids and yeah. the schools and coaching and things like that. So we'll do another one on that and then maybe we'll catch up after the King of the Air as well. Yeah. But thank you very much for your time That's and your right. hospitality and your very humble abode in Cape Town. I don't think you'll need to edit anything. No, really. you're just, I'm just going to go <laughs> home really and just like, just listen to it back, yeah. upload it, job done. Lewis, good luck for the Thanks. event. Thank, Thank you, you very much lovely. indeed for your time. That was brilliant. Thanks a lot. There we have it. Episode 19, done and dusted, in the bag. First Cape Town one done. I'm hoping I'm going to get the kite surfing magazine published uh, this week, which will mean I've then got a bit more time to dive into these podcasts and chase a few people and get a few more episodes sorted out for you guys. So that's going to be my focus over the next week or so. Get the magazine done and then go full podcast crazy. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Lewis. I love chatting to him. He's got some fantastic opinions and an incredible outlook on life. And he's a very grounded guy. And I think just listening back to that was really inspiring to hear, you know, how from his modest beginnings, he's gone on to really make it on the world stage, which is a tough thing to do in a sport that's very expensive. When you think about all the traveling that's involved, unless you're getting serious support from sponsors or your parents it's quite hard to get to all these events and go to all these places so lewis is one of those guys that's really made it from nothing and i respect that a lot next week i'll have another episode for you on monday um i'm not going to spoil the surprise by who it might be right now i don't actually have one recorded so i'll be chasing down some of the big names this week on the down days uh it might be a possibly a post king of the air episode and we might be talking to the the new champion who knows it it all depends on the forecast out here. The wind's been a little bit better the last few days, but it hasn't been great um, since I arrived a couple of weeks ago. As ever, if you've enjoyed this episode, then please give it a thumbs up on social media. Help me spread the word. That makes a big difference. And a huge thank you to all the people that have given it a rating on the App Store. And a few people are starting to leave reviews as well. So that's really helpful as well. Just um, let's Apple push it to the front a little bit more. And it's always difficult when you're in a niche sport like this. Anyway, next week I'll be back with a new episode. Who knows, we might even have a new King of the Air champion by then. You've been listening to me, Rue Chater, and the Intriguing Beings podcast. Have a fantastic week. Thank you.